grassroots North Carolina has been much more aggressive in challenging restrictive gun laws in the courts. An out-of-control Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives has so far handed down two gun bans by regulatory fiat and will soon impose a third. I'm here with Paul Vallone, president of Grassroots North Carolina and our state's most effective gun rights organization, to discuss a positive development that just might be the key to shutting down the ATF's unconstitutional bans. Last week, the Fifth Court of Appeals rendered a decision striking down the so-called bump stock ban. Tell us more about that, Paul. Sure. Um, Basically, using the mass killing in Las Vegas as a pretext, in 2018, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, or ATF, unilaterally changed its interpretation of what constitutes a machine gun in order to ban so-called bump stocks. And by the way, in doing so, the ATF reversed its longstanding previous determination that bump stocks were not machine guns and therefore perfectly legal. And rest assured that bump stocks are not, in fact, machine guns. A machine gun is a gun that fires multiple bullets with a single function of the trigger. But a firearm equipped with a bump stock doesn't do that. It fires one shot per trigger pull, and it just enables the user to pull the trigger somewhat faster. In truth, somebody who knows what they're doing can do that with a rubber band. Now, regardless of the bump stock, a rifle remains functionally identical to millions of common hunting rifles possessed by lawful citizens. So, Paul, tell us more about the case that was in question there. Well, the case is Cargill versus Garland and all, and is ironically the last of four cases against the bump stock ban. Um, Challenges have, have actually been rejected by the 6th, 10th, and D.C. Circuit's, uh, circuit Courts of Appeal, um, while actually being supported by the 5th Circuit. The good news is that contradictory opinions increase the likelihood that the Supreme Court will grant a writ of certiorari or a hearing in the case. Interestingly, although the 6th Circuit rejected the case made by Grassroots North Carolina, Gun Owners of America, and other Second Amendment organizations, uh, many of the arguments we made in this case, were cited by the majority decision in Cargill. Um, the main reason that uh, the Fifth Circuit ruled for the plaintiffs here was that the devices in question don't meet the definition of a machine gun, as defined by the 1934 National Firearms Act and the 1968 Gun Control Act. The court noted that, uh, per the definition, a machine gun fires multiple rounds with a single function, that's the operative word, function of the trigger but a bump stock relies on multiple functions of the trigger. And uh, the court rejected the ATF's attempt to change the definition of a single function of the trigger, uh, which would have included the pull of the trigger by the trigger finger. Uh, The majority decision in in Cargo, by the way, includes a wonderfully detailed and technically accurate description of the mechanics of triggers and sears, and which determined that the 1934 Firearms Act referred only to the mechanical aspects of a single function of the trigger, not the actions of the trigger finger. Now, also at at issue here was the concept of Chevron deference. The fundamental principle established in a landmark 1984 Supreme Court case that upholds reasonable, that's the word there, reasonable agency interpretations of ambiguous statutes Congress has tasked the agency with implementing. It could apply here, at least to the extent that the new definition of machine gun is ambiguous. And in fact, other courts have said that Chevron deference does apply to the bump stock ban. The Fifth Circuit, although not required to rule on Chevron deference because the ATF didn't use the defense, it noted that Chevron deference should only be applied to civil cases, not to criminal prosecutions. In fact, Instead of Chevron deference, the Fifth Circuit applied what is called the rule of lenity, meaning that when a law is clear or uh, unclear or ambiguous, the court should apply it in a way that's most favorable to the defendant or to construe the statute against the state. So So 
what role did GRNC play with this? Well, um, in light of the recent Supreme Court decision affirming the right to bear arms outside the home, and that would be the Bruin case, uh, grassroots North Carolina has been much more aggressive in challenging restrictive gun laws in the courts. Um, in fact, um, in this case, uh, Grassroots North Carolina, along with Gun Owners of America and several other organizations, um, we took three actions. First, we're a party to an amicus brief in the Sixth Circuit. Then we were a party to another brief in the Tenth Circuit. And finally, we're a party to this brief in the Cargo case, a brief which, by the way, was cited in the majority opinion, arguing that bump stocks do not fit the definition of a machine gun and that the ATF had no authority to effectively make laws. I know the Supreme Court de declined to take up this case late last year. You mentioned that the Supreme Court might be motivated to take up this case now. Why? Well, so far, the decisions have been all over the map. Uh, the Tenth Circuit and the D.C. Circuit upheld the ban. Uh, in the case in which Grassroots North Carolina joined GOA in the Sixth Circuit, first we had a hearing from a three-judge panel which struck down the ban. But then there was an on-bank hearing of the entire court which vacated the three-judge panel's ruling, and, and it split evenly, leaving the ban in place. Meanwhile, judges have been equally inconsistent in applying and determining whether Chevron deference applies. So although the Supreme Court previously refused to hear one of the cases, the conflicting opinions on the ban, I think, greatly increase the chance that the high court will give the case a writ of certiorari again, granting it a hearing. But beyond the bump stock ban itself, uh, is there a larger issue? What is that? Uh, there's a much larger issue. Yes, indeed. Under the U.S. Constitution, it is the executive branch, including agencies like the ATF, that are supposed to enforce laws, not to write them. Legislating is the role of Congress. And if agencies like the ATF are allowed to steal that power, and that's what they did in this case, they stole that power, then they become omnipotent. There is no power they cannot exercise, there is nothing they cannot do, and there is nothing they cannot ban, all while denying you, the citizen, the voice you're entitled to under the Constitution. And matter of fact, on this issue, the majority decision in Cargill says, and I quote, for many jurists, the question of Congress's uh, delegating legislative power to the executive in the context of criminal statutes raises serious constitutional concerns. We do not reach this issue because we do not have to. But if we did, it would only provide more support for the conclusion that a semi-automatic rifle equipped with a non-mechanical bump stock is not a machine gun for purposes of federal law. This is a good decision. Now, later this month, the ATF is expected to announce a new reinterpretation of their regulation on pistol stabilizing braces. Do you think this decision will have any impact on that? An excellent point. Uh, as it was proposed, this latest reversal, and it's a reversal, could make felons out of people who own an estimated 4 million AR-15 style pistols if they are equipped with stabilizing braces. Remember, stabilizing braces were initially determined to help or were developed to help wounded warriors shoot relatively heavy AR-15 pistols. These are not shoulder stocks. They are braces. Now, even though the ATF previously determined, by the way, that they were perfectly legal, and frankly, the point system that they proposed in their notice of proposed rulemaking is so arbitrary and ambiguous that most people won't know whether they're in compliance or not potentially creating millions of accidental felons. Because if they're no longer pistols, then they would be required to be registered as short-barreled rifles under the 1934 National Firearms Act. Now, I don't think the ATF will face the same hurdles over definitions that they face with bump stocks. But in terms of trying to steal power from the legislative branch and on application of the lenity rule for ambig ambiguous statutes, yeah, I would say the ATF probably has a problem on its hands. What do you say to those that argue banning bump stocks is good policy? We could debate policy, but I would answer that the majority decision in the Cargill case correctly noted that it isn't the role of the judiciary to determine what good policy is. 
just as the it isn't the role of the executive branch to make law, neither it is, is it the role of the judicial branch. Making laws which determine public policy is the role of the representatives duly elected by citizens and only those elected representatives. Paul, thank you for joining us today. And it's been a good conversation. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me, Mark. 